Hey everyone, so just popping on today, I won't be able to get on tomorrow, but I wanted to make sure I do a live video this week. So here we are. Uh, happy Tuesday, Two Minute Tuesday. Hopefully you guys, you checked out the two minute video this morning. Uh, today's was on drain, drain tubes um, and kind of how we use them when we embalm at the funeral home. So Check that out if you have not already and post questions or comments below on that video. Like it if you like it. Share it if you want to share it. A uh, few things for this uh, today. I've got some questions people have thrown at me. Um, somebody had asked me about a sign. Hey, everybody, that I had up during one of the videos. It's a little busted. So in a heartbeat, our lives changed forever. In a heartbeat, you were here soft and sweet. In a heartbeat... We're first steps, two wheelers and roller skates. In a heartbeat, we're best friends, sleepovers and broken hearts. In a heartbeat was a special one, engagement rings and wedding bells. You've grown up before our eyes in a heartbeat. So something my parents had given me, but it was sitting back here in one of the videos and someone asked what it said because you couldn't read the whole thing. So there you go, guys. Um, Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. Um, love some of the familiar faces that I usually have on Wednesday mornings. Hello, Carrie, I was curious if a person's cremated remains can be placed inside the casket of a predeceased loved one, and if possible, does the casket come back up to ground level or does it remain in the vault and opened and the urn placed inside? Plus, would an immediate surviving relative need to witness the exhumation and reinterment to make sure the deceased wishes were carried out properly. Well, it's what you're asking is one quite, it's kind of a costly maneuver to do. So uh, Steve is asking if let's say your mom died and she was buried and then your dad died and you wanted him inside of her casket in his urn because he was cremated. Could you, or what are the logistics of, opening his casket and placing the cremated remains in with him. When you bury mom, you're gonna to wanna to know that that's the plan ahead. If you were to purchase a sealed vault, we can't just unseal the vault to get to your mom's casket to place that urn inside with her. We would need to basically destroy the vault to get it open, to get to the casket, and then you would have to purchase a new vault. So, I would recommend if you were to do that to me, have an unseal, just a grave liner. So we could then just lift the lid off, place the urn in and then replace the lid on. Now, <laughs> um, a lot more logistics because the vault or the casket is not coming above ground. You could do it all down in the hole. Theoretically, uh, you don't need a disinterment permit. A permit is needed when you're transferring the deceased from one place to another if that casket comes above ground. But you would be paying an opening and closing at the cemetery again to get to there. You would need a vault company to come in to move the lid. Um, and then, you, you know, so you would have those and then you would have the fee of the funeral home to oversee this number can be there. There's nothing we can do to prevent you. If you wanted to view your loved one's remains, even if it's only been six weeks, we don't know what they look like. So I'm betting most of any funeral home will have you sign a whole lot of paperwork because we don't know what you're viewing. We don't, we don't know what's going to, what they're going to look like in there, let alone you knowing what they're going to look like. Like if somebody insisted, they signed paperwork to kind of release us of all liability from, you know, mental, whatever, uh, mental anguish. Um, I would still have the person wait in the car while we opened the casket. So I could see what the individual looked like first, and then would have a conversation with the family to see if they really wanted to see their loved one or not. Um, so, you know, they could, if they didn't, they could view from the road and watch us place the person down in the casket. I would just be really having a conversation. Do we really want to do this or can we place the urn on top of the vault down in the ground? So they're buried on the same lot. That's what most people do. Um, so then all you're doing is paying to bury the cremated remains rather than disinterring, you know, the grave space. So a lot of logistics there. Um, 
I don't know anybody who's gone through all of that, but if it was your wish, I mean, that's the wish. So, hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Hey, in Texas, from the pool, Aunt Josie, you're at the pool listening. That's fun. Would it be better to purchase a double depth and just reopen to place cremated remains? Um, So you don't need a double depth if there's cremated remains. Every cemetery I've ever encountered, you can place two individuals on one space, if not up to four, as long as three of them are cremated, if not all four. So all you would do is just bury the cremated remains on top of the casketed individual. So it wouldn't need to be a double depth. That would be, you know, overuse of space. A grave liner is a basic concrete vault. And so it's called a grave liner because it simply does that. It lines the grave with concrete with a flat lid on top. Thanks so much, clandestine girl. Welcome. How much would that be? Every cemetery is different. Every vault company is going to be different. Every funeral home is going to be different. So there is no way I could tell you. You could have a $200 opening and closing charge at one cemetery and a $2,500 opening and closing charge at another cemetery. So that's how wide the range is in terms of charging just to open the grave space itself. What is a grave blanket? A grave blanket is a big blanket of flowers that is laid on top of the grave. They're very regional. That's not something we do here anywhere near me that I know of. Um, But some people have come from like Chicago, New York area, like bigger city areas where it's maybe more traditional and they've gone to order them. And there's florists who don't even, they don't have the right things to put them together and they'll, you know, they'll figure it out and stuff, but it's not the norm where I am. Hey, everybody, you're interested in becoming a mortician, but I'm afraid of seeing someone I know. Hopefully, by the time you see someone you know, you will be in a mortician mindset, which means that you will have kind of retrained your brain to understand that kind of a shell is a shell and that what made them a person is not is not really there anymore. And so your brain thinks differently, but you lived your whole life knowing that if someone's bleeding, they're feeling pain. And if someone's in front of you, you know, they're talking or they're alive. And so you kind of retrain your brain to know that you can cut somebody and they'll bleed and they're not going to feel it because they're dead. So you retrain it. Um, so hopefully by the time you care for somebody, you know, your brain would maybe be retrained. Um, and so until you're in it, you, you can't know. There's this huge anticipation of these big moments, but until you're in them, you really have no idea how you're going to react or how you're going to do or how emotionally it will affect you. Um, So all you can do is try. And if it's too overwhelming and emotional, then you step back and you let someone else handle everything. That's honestly all you can do. Do you know Steve Cash? I do not. Is that a funeral director? Rich, you can't get them in Chicago? Are green burials expensive compared to straight cremation? What does straight cremation, Joanna, mean to you? Like a direct cremation? Um, And it depends what you want to do for the green burial. You know, if you're going to have visitation or if you're going to have, you know, these are the things is that it's what service items lead up to the disposition. Because it's just that disposition choice doesn't determine the cost, it's everything else that's involved. What kind of shroud are you using? What kind of casket are you using? Um, what kind of you know services are you having? Those things all determine costs. Um, I went to Cincinnati for my mortuary school. How common are free cemeteries where I am? Not common anymore. I mean, it used to be if you, bo- if you lived in like the township or in the city, then you got so many grave spaces for free. But you know, every once in a while we'll run into maybe like it's $25 for a grave space. If you live in the township, not so much anymore. I want to say back when I first started in the business, um, that was over 20 years ago. We ran into that a little bit, but the, the free grave spaces had pretty much gone to the wayside. Yeah. So like church cemeteries, you would need to be a paying parishioner, but some of them would say, oh, well, you have to have tithed so much over a certain period of time and, you know, certain things like that. So there's a lot of stipulations um, to it. Hey, Tiffany. 
was a YouTuber of Talking Kitty Cat. Mm, yeah, no idea who that is. No, they won't do that anymore. That's weird. At all the cemeteries? Yes, direct cremation, no visitation. It, so direct cremation, you know, you're going to, it depends when where you go. You can find a really low budget cremation place for like $800 in certain areas um, because they are doing high volume cremation, no services, no anything, just kind of the cremation factory, if you want to call it that. I hate to say that, but at those low prices, you have to do high volume in order to be making a profit. Um, so, or if you go to kind of a traditional funeral home that doesn't mix, you may get into $3,200, $4,000. So it depends on what you're comparing to each other. How do you yourself deal with dealing with sadness and grief day after day? Um, when you're watching TV at night, you're still thinking about the family from that morning. Not usually. No, because I'm not dealing with grief. The family is dealing with that. They're dealing with a loss and you don't really get into grief actually psychologically for two weeks after a loss, like has been what has been proven through um, studies because you're in too numb of a phase that you can't really enter into grief until they're past me um, in working at the funeral home. So I'm working with people who have lost somebody. I haven't lost somebody. So what I'm doing is caring for them. So every day I get to care for people. I'm not dealing with, I'm not feeling the pain. I'm not, you know, in loss and I'm not in grief. So I am caring for somebody. I get to take care of somebody. That's a great job getting to take care of somebody every day. I get to meet their needs. I get to make sure they're taken care of and doing what they need to do. I get to kind of be the light in darkness if you want to get all, you know, big and metaphorical. And so it's a great thing I get to do, really. Can you do a day in the life of a funeral doctor during this pandemic? Um, not really. Uh, there's not much. I mean, it's basically just like my other day in the life of a funeral doctor video I did. I just wear a mask and I'm meeting with less people in the arrangement room. You know, some people were restricting to how many people come in the arrangement room. Um, and then I wear a mask. Otherwise, it's not much different. Um, there's We're not having visitations where we are. We're only doing graveside services, and those have been opened up to now 100 people at a graveside. So we're kind of almost back to a new normal, per se. Um, we're going to, like, going to a national cemetery. They just opened back up to doing services with 10 people there at the shelter again. Um, for They were doing no services, drop-offs only, so they're, they would bury somebody, but nobody could be present. So they've just opened back up, but they're still sanitizing. So if someone was a COVID death, then they sanitize and spray down the casket and the urn um, before burial. So there's just a lot more restrictions. So not a ton it has changed in terms of what you would see in a video, I guess. How do they know not to hit the next person casket when digging? because it's all gridded out and it's all marked out by, by measurement. Is it desecration of me to send internal organs with the body after us? A medical examiner to send internal organs. I don't know what that means. Desic discretion of, oh, is it the discretion of the medical examiner to send internal organs with the body after autopsy? No, everything comes back. Sometimes they retain um, certain things if they're part of the investigation or part of what they're looking into, but they will send us a list of what they retained. How do you help people on the autism spectrum dealing with death and grief who don't understand what's going on at funerals or losing a parent or loved one? It's really, I mean, it depends on the spectrum of the autism. You could have somebody that has a, I mean, there's it's a, such a broad spectrum. I guess you would need to give me an example, of, like a specific example, and I could help you. Like, I would tell you what I would do. Like, if I'm at a cemetery and I'm out at a grave and there's kids around, I will have them step up to the hole if they want to and look down in so they can see the vault while the casket's up on the lift. Because that's the only time they'll really see the base of the vault. Or I'll point out the vaults next to that one that's down on the hole because 
most of the time you can see a breakthrough there. Hey, Robert. Uh, most of the time you can see a breakthrough there of the other vault because that's how close they are. So I, I will explain things and kind of show them things so they don't have a lot of the questions. I'll lift up the overlay so they can see the person's foot if they're up there and they're peeking around and like look like they're curi curious and want to know. I will kind of offer an answer if I hear people talking about things or maybe questions, I will step in with answers. So I'm an eavesdropper and I have no problem doing that to make sure good, accurate answers are given to kids, to anybody. So it's not even just with, you know, autism. So when my grandpa died, my grandma um, had had dementia and Alzheimer's for years. Um, she carried around a baby doll. Like she just was that person. She didn't connect to things. She remembered everything long ago. So when my grandpa died first, he was in the casket. Hey, Steve Bennett. Um, and he was in the casket and she didn't connect to who he was in that casket at all. Nothing. So when she came in to kind of do the viewing, she was like, uh-huh. Okay. And then we walked around the room and we were looking at pictures. Well, when you showed her a picture of my grandpa from when they were young she would say, that's my honey. That's my boyfriend. So we went over and watched the video and we looked through pictures and I got her looking at pictures and she looked at a picture and said, that's my honey. That's my boyfriend. That's my sweetheart. And I said, do you know what? That's who's over there. It is. I said, do you want to go over and see him? Well, yeah, let's go over and see him. So we went over to him knowing that's who it was. So it was connecting some dots that were not connecting in her brain. Um, and I feel like she had a moment of clarity and a moment of understanding and she gave him a kiss. And there was just like this really beautiful moment that things connected for her that hadn't been connecting. So that was a good thing. So it's each situation is different. There's no, here's how to deal with somebody with autism because there's, it's too big of a it's a spectrum um, to, you know, figure out it, it's situational. Every situation is very individualized. I'm sorry, I'm scanning back up. And so is PTSD a problem in the funeral industry? Definitely. I think it's not as recognized that that's maybe what somebody's going through as PTSD, but there's definitely um, funerals we go through. And afterwards we, you know, we hit bottom or, you know, there is suicide. There's a lot of alcoholism. There's a lot of, you know, big things that happen within funeral directors because we do have a lot of psychological stuff that we go through and we don't process. And I don't, I think we don't have enough self-care. Um, it's not been really recognized what we go through in a lot of ways. So um, I think self-care and some of the younger generation is understanding that, you know, we do more for ourselves and we need to get, you know, more help and therapists are kind of trendy to go to. It's not that big a deal. You can, you can get an app where you, you know, do a text therapy session with somebody like for real, it's crazy. Um, but so it's more handy and it's more readily available. So I think there's more support than there used to be where it used to be very taboo maybe to go to a therapist. Um, how are you guys in the States dealing with the deceased? If you know, they have COVID. Oh, oh, you're putting plastic over their heads. Um, on removals and stuff, people are, you know, covering the faces, they're spraying um, disinfectant in the nose and in the mouth and in the eyes and kind of covering the face. Whereas maybe we would leave the head exposed during removals. So it really depends on the funeral home. Also, there's funeral homes that do not open a, the body bag. They will not embalm. They will not do anything. But there's others that are embalming at same as normal and doing, you know, as long as we're adhering to the number of people at the visitations and such, they're still having a viewing if the person's involved, embalmed and having funerals and things as usual. So it just depends which funeral home, honestly, and their comfort level. The most surprising thing I've seen someone buried with. Boy, I don't know if there's anything that's surprising anymore. I'll have to think about it. I know I talked a lot about it in, I have a video on things that people are buried with. 
Um, so go check that video out. Cause I know I talked about a lot of things I'm on, you know, immediate recall. I'd have to go back to honestly that video. Cause I thought before that video and made lists of things. And, um, a lot of people posted things in the comments on things that their family has done. So those were really great. How many hours do I typically work? So it depends. Um, since I'm a, a freelance funeral director and a trade embalmer, it depends on how often somebody calls me. I may work only one day a week. You know, I may work nine, 10 hours, or I may work a whole week, or I may work, you know, a couple of bombings a day if somebody's calling or, you know, they may not call for a long time. So it's, it's a huge swing um, when it comes to hours working. No, I've never seen Don't Drop the Coffin. I'll have to check that out. Sorry, I'm scanning quick. Hey, Buford, I love that name. And you have to be from Tennessee if you're named Buford, I swear. That's a shame, Carrie, about your grandmother. No, it was, you know, it wasn't, but it was one of those things. I feel like as long as the family embraces kind of the, the new personality of the person, and rather than combating them and fighting against them, you can have a good new relationship with that person in their new identity after this, you know, disease has set in, if that makes sense. I've seen families that have given play checks to individuals who are bankers and all they wanted to do was write checks. And they thought they were still paying their bills and they thought they were doing you know, things that they used to do and still had a lot of control, but they didn't realize it was just a, you know, pretend. So thank you so much, Peg. That's so sweet. I love you guys don't know what your, uh, your support and your comments do for me. It's so amazing. No, we don't have conductors here in America. That's definitely not something we do. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen my videos about going over to England um, to work at a funeral home there. And I got to wear a top hat. I was so excited. Um, one day I'm going to have my own top hat. I promise. So very fun. I did the same thing you did with having a beer with your father. Um, yeah, I had a beer with my grandpa. Yes. Yep. And I put um, my empty in with my grandpa. It was really special. Lost a close friend Sunday. You know, the protests, you can't really stop them. Um, it's, but we're trying to adhere with funerals and stuff to the rules and regulations. Um, so I know life doesn't ever seem fair. It's never going to be perfect for everybody, but it definitely is hard to see all the protests and things and know that you can't have everybody at your funeral that you'd want there. Isn't the name Buford great, Kathy? I love it. I love her. It, it reminds me, um, was it Back to the Future 3? Buford Tanner, I think was the guy's name. He was kind of the bad guy. Not that you're a bad guy, Buford. But um, as things start opening up, are you seeing that your services as a freelancer is trying to get back to normal? Yes, it's starting to um, get back. I'm going in for shorter periods because I'm not needed for a whole day. We're not having the the phone calls that used to come through and this drop-ins and, you know, people being tied up. The directors aren't tied up as long with, you know, visitations and services. We just go for a quick graveside and back. And so as things get back to normal and as people start um, utilizing the services more of the directors, then they're going to be tied up more. And then that means we need more directors to see families and to do things. Oh, thank you, Pastor Jack. That's a Starting school in October, a restorative art. I am not an artist by any means. So you do your best. It's fun. To me, it was a fun class to do. Um, you would get together and work on your heads together and, you know, learn the different things. You definitely, it's a new skill set, learning um, the balance of a face and, you know, that this part on your face is the same length as this part on your body or, you know, all these things. So you definitely learn a lot of perspective. You're going to find yourself staring at people's faces when you're talking to them <laughs> and like thinking, hmm, if I had to reconstruct their nose, what would I do? But I do that anyway. Like as a funeral director, I'll be like, 
oh, I would have to color on her eyebrows or look at her lipstick or look at his ears. I would totally pluck them. You start thinking these things when you're talking to people and you try not to do it, but it just happens. I went to Cincinnati for school. Lisa, that is a serious commitment to have watched all my videos. That's over 400, like, which is insane that there's that many videos. But I guess if you figure I have one every Tuesday and a coffee every week. So that's 104 videos just a year there, which is seriously mind blowing, guys. Mind blowing. Um, I have really enjoyed the States videos. I've got some people from countries emailing me too. So those videos have been just such a blessing to do. I did one. Um, with several of you actually that are in here. So it's been really fun. Were the restoration techniques in six feet under accurate? They did, you know, they did really good work on kind of presenting some of what we do. We do use all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, plaster of Paris and this and that. And okay, if we took this tubing and cut it in half, could we create the, the arch on the ear? And if we used a straw, could we recreate this? Sometimes you just have to get really MacGyver on it and figure out what you can use to recreate what you're needing to recreate. Um, that TV show did a really good job showing a lot of different situations. And I know some of those deaths seemed pretty off the wall, but not so much. Like people die in every sort of crazy way. So it's not so crazy to think that that would, oh, some of that would happen. Oh, Trevor, that's really cool. His wife at her wedding had, everybody in the audience had roses and they gave them to her for every year her grandma was alive and that made her flower bouquet. All the competitors here are so friendly and respectful to each other. Brilliant job you do, Carrie. Thank you so much. Bodie Topham. So Bodie and I graduated from mortuary school together. He's out in Utah. Bodie, I'm so happy to see you. Are you still in Utah? Did you go to Colorado? Why am I blank on that? When are you coming to Northern California? Um, I need to come back to California. It's been a while since I've been in California. Um, we've talked about getting back out there because we have family there. My great grandpa passed away in April in the funeral home we picked. Let me stand in and watch the full embalming dressing and cascading. Oh, that's awesome. Jalen. I think that's so cool that you got to be part of that. The two cans of cat food. Yes. I don't think I would use cans of cat food. Um, and embalming and doing things, but can you coordinate with Mike at a show setting the vault? So I've talked to a vault company about doing the vault side of it because Micah does the grave digging. Isn't he great though? I just love Micah. Um, and so I have a vault company that I've talked to where we have to figure out the right, it's going to have to be like all the stars aligning that I can get there early enough in the morning, get on a, you know, a truck with one of the guys that is going to do, you know, the right setup at the right time. And so we've got to get all our stars aligned. And for right now with the COVID, you know, we weren't, you know, we couldn't do the ride along and things like that. So, oh, lots of classes. We have a lot of pre -requ pre prerequisite classes. <laughs> Classes, I can't talk. Um, and then you have your mortuary school classes. And classes go the full spectrum of everything. Um, for whatever reason, you know, we don't we don't study in just one area. It's not like there's mortician classes. We have to know a little about a whole lot of different areas. So we need to know a, a little accounting, a little um psychology, a little sociology, a little anthropology, a little um, public speaking, um, anatomy and chemistry and all these different areas that we have to know enough of. Um, and then you start putting it all together. And then once you get into your mortuary classes, you take like mortuary law and you take chemistry pertaining and you take embalming class and you take, you know, anatomy pertaining to 
um, embalming. And so then it gets a little more specific, a little more specific, a little more specific. Yeah, I thought you were headed to Colorado for a little bit, Bodhi, but Bodhi and his wife, Millie, um, were some of my favorite, favorite people at Mortuary School. So love them. Yes. So Lisa, there are different styles of vaults. Some are where the top of it looks like this and it comes down onto a base. So some of them are, as you would say, upside down. Um, it's just a different style vault. That's not what we're used to around here. The, um, we could always order one like that, but that's not the style we're used to here. Ours are the bottom and then with a lid on top. Um, Trevor, that's what my initial video was with the tour of the embalming room was a Facebook live tour. Um, I could do another tour of an embalming room with for a YouTube live. I could do another one like three years later. Here we are touring again. We could do that. Let me look at time. All right. We'll take a couple more questions. Are we running out of available land for gray spaces in the big cities? Um, you know, space is limited um, in the world. So with the rise in cremation, it definitely changes the projection. You know, where we run into, you know, the problems is if there was a program where we could figure out where there's like one space here, one space here, one space here, like a family owned eight lots and only five of them got used. Those could sit empty literally forever because nobody knows they're there or because nobody plans to use them and they moved away. But figuring out how those three lots could then be used back again by the cemetery, if there was a way to figure all that out, every cemetery has these empty lots that are never going to be used, which is wasted space. So if we could figure out how to get that wasted space reclaimed to be used as a burial space, that would be something to do. Um, in the UK, we never use purple flashing light. So every state has their own color light. Um, here in Michigan, we use purple or um, sometimes you can use orange, that orange is yellow, but it's usually purple here in Michigan. How do they keep the embalming fluid from exiting the body? Well, the fluid's inside your vasculature system. So it's inside your arteries and your veins. So it just stays there and the kind of fumes from it permeate out into your tissues. And that's what does the preserving. If there's a hole, it's obviously going to come out, um, leak out, but we can, you know, glue over that hole and if need be. Ooh, Tiffany, that's a good thing. I wonder what the like time-wise and, and such is. So I would have to look into that to see if we had one of those here. I don't think, I don't think we do. And I don't know if people would devote the time to go and do the reclaiming. So, well, cool guys. I am going to sign off for today. I like to keep these around 30 minutes, but I will see you guys next week, possibly Friday. We'll see how Friday goes. Again, last week I wasn't able to jump on, um, but send me questions. I'll miss you guys tomorrow, but send me questions over, post them on the video and we'll get to your questions next time. So thanks everyone. Bye.